Namaste. This is Yoga Therapy Podcast and I'm your host, Shira Cohen, yoga teacher, yoga therapist and Ayurvedic wellness educator. In these conversations with experts in the field of yoga therapy, you'll find out what it is and how it can help you and your loved ones to reclaim well-being. We'll touch on physical as well as mental health, physiology, emotions, women's health, spiritual well-being, goddesses, and self-development in the fullest sense. Listening to another story can change ours, so thank you for showing up, and let's begin this journey together. Hello, hello everyone. Today we are with Candice Clark. She is from South Africa, so I'm going to be asking her a little about South Africa. Um, she's a licensed counselor and a certified yoga therapist specializing in trauma and mental health, um, especially for PTSD. So welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. It's so lovely to meet you and connect. Yeah, I'm really happy to have you on. So yeah, Candace reached out and she's got this really warm presence and fully there. So I'm really happy to have you on. So tell us, tell us your story. How did you arrive to yoga and when did it become therapy or maybe it was straight away? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was the case for a lot of uh, yoga therapists. Um, yeah, so my, my story is actually quite personal and it's uh, very closely tied to where I'm at now, I've kind of come full circle. So what I mean by that is I, I knew from quite a young age I wanted to study psychology. Um, so I left high school or what I suppose you would call secondary school um, <laughs> and then went into tertiary education at university, started studying psychology. But very soon into my first year of studying psychology, I had a couple multiple traumas um, kind of happen cumulatively over a very short space of month, I would say within kind of three or four months. Um, serious life-threatening traumas that happened to me. I don't share the actual examples just because I'm so aware of trigger warnings <laughs> um, and other people listening to the podcast that could be triggered. But of course, you know, if anybody wanted to reach out and ask me about them, I'm happy to share. And I have shared them publicly before. Um, but that experience really rocked me. So I was studying psychology and I was learning about trauma, but I wasn't really making the connection to my own healing. Um, was seeing psychologists, was really trying to kind of heal from it, wasn't really working. And I suppose over time, I just thought it's resolved. I mean, it definitely wasn't now that I look back on it. But I think I just thought like this, you know, it's not really working for me. Let me move on with my life. Um, but what happened is I ended up developing fibromyalgia, which is a chronic mm. pain condition, mm. um, which we know now has a lot of patients with fibromyalgia have their roots in trauma. Trauma. Um, I went back to a psychologist. Um, my psychologist at the time actually referred me to a, um, a mindfulness-based stress reduction program. I'd never done yoga or any mindfulness before. Went on that. It was an amazing experience. And that really just opened up the world of yoga to me. And I could mm. feel something shifting. Mm. I couldn't put words to it, but I could feel there was – my body was starting to heal in ways that I'd never experienced before. Mm. Um, that led me obviously on to be a, a yoga teacher. Um, I did a trauma sensitive yoga teacher training. I started working with group. I was, um, I had finished my psychology uh, undergraduate and postgraduate qualification. I had become a licensed counselor and I realized I wanted to, you know, work with groups, but I also wanted to go a bit deeper and yoga therapy was a great option for me. So then I obviously completed my yoga therapy um, qualification and then just kind of dived in head first, um, <laughs> working with trauma survivors one-on-one, -on, -one, um, working in, on group therapy programs. And just, yeah, my testimony is that yoga was therapy for me and yoga helped me integrate and process trauma that the other modalities I had access to, even my own um, clinical training, mm. was not actually getting to the, to the root of mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I've really done that full circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. And I looked on your website and it's, it's, you're very real and very honest and very open and you can really hear the story, even though the story isn't there, but you can feel 
the depth. And um, yes, thank you for sharing. So yeah, and, and what I really hear is that it's so important. Yes, the cognitive to understand the trauma is important, but it doesn't heal unless we actually use the body as well. And I would like you to go into that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, something I, I should have just mentioned is um, I'm completing my master's degree in public health. Mm -hmm. I'm really passionate about mental health care at a population level. Um, I, I love working one-on-one -on -one and in group programs, but I've also got quite an activist heart. Um, <laughs> and I want to change some of what we experience in public mental health, which is why I'm doing that master's degree. And that thesis is focused on trauma-sensitive yoga in the South African context. Um, so the reason I'm giving you this background is just because it helps with answering that question. Mm -hmm. So my thesis, I've spent a lot of time understanding PTSD and trauma and traditional modalities to that, which obviously a lot of it is cognitive therapy. Um, and then kind of the emerging research is really around yoga and partly meditation and mindfulness, but but obviously what I'm focused on is pre predominantly yoga and um, all the different limbs of yoga. And um, what's interesting is what research is showing us around cognitive therapy um, is that it does work. There's lots of research that shows us it works, but mm -hmm. yoga can often produce the same results, sometimes quicker and with higher retention rates mm -hmm. because because clients are not having to recall traumatic memories, they are not having to use um, yeah, so memory recall and verbal processing, which we know can be actually be triggering, really traumatizing for yeah. some, yeah, for some people. Um, it can cause high dropout rates, which the research shows us in cognitive therapy. So you know, if you've got an option to offer somebody something that is likely going to result in retaining them and produce very similar, if not better results to cognitive therapy. That lasts longer. More cost effective because we don't, especially in the South African context, we don't actually have access to mental health professionals very mm. readily. Mm. And why wouldn't we be offering that? Why wouldn't that be like kind of a standard prescription for somebody struggling with uh, PTSD or, or even just post-traumatic stress? Because even post-traumatic stress that's not diagnosed as PTSD is still quite significantly debilitating. Mm. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm quite <laughs> yes well you're passionate and so you should be <laughs> yeah no I totally agree and I I also find it so amazing that we can bypass the whole conscious part of the brain and just use the body and the breath and move through that trauma without re-triggering the memories and the feelings and emotions associated yeah. So yeah, an interesting, I mean, an interesting concept. In fact, I was um, listening to a very prominent trauma researcher speak today, and she was just speaking about how um, trauma recall is very common and very traditional and part of kind of what we know to work in cognitive therapy. But what that really means is a dual awareness. So it's being able to recall something state where you aren't triggered so that's really what you're getting at with cognitive therapy with memory recall right so eye movement um desensitization therapy cognitive behavioral therapy it's about being able to speak through that trauma right through the trauma imagine the trauma but in, in a more relaxed integrated state so that you experience those memories obviously in a, in a different way they're not as overwhelming but yoga is proven to be doing the same thing because what we're teaching our students and our clients is distress tolerance right so if you come mm. up into a pose you notice your heart rate's high you notice you're sweating you notice your pulse has gone up how do we manage that how mm. do we interpret those somatic signals positively and how do we use our breath and our movement and um our mindful awareness i suppose to manage that distress so in that way you're actually achieving dual awareness without the threat of re-triggering um the client 
sorry i mean i'm getting into a lot of detail here but that's really the no 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 i love it I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to process it at the same time as you <laughs> telling me about it <laughs> I know. i'm like neck deep in the research so i know but but yeah i mean essentially it's just it's just that there's a reason why memory recall and verbal processing happens in cognitive therapy mm -hmm. that that same underlying function can also happen in yoga therapy for trauma and research is proving that it can happen, that it's mm -hmm. not necessary for there to be verbal recall and, um, sorry, memory recall and verbal processing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's good news. Yeah. Um, what did I want to ask? There was something you said, um, yeah, about the stress. So it's also about building a resilience at the same time and not moving into a stressful state too quickly and knowing you have tools and wiring to a more uh, positive and strong and resilient sense of self that we are creating. So we have this kind of center that we can come back to if we come up against those emotions and memories. Absolutely, absolutely. And what's really interesting is that changes. So at the start of therapy, I use external orientation with my clients. So <clears throat> we do things like the five senses technique, which I can take you through, mm -hmm. um, which is nothing to do with their breath and their body and everything, anything overwhelming internally, it's orientating externally. Mm -hmm. Once once we've worked through that and mastered that, then we move to pairing breath with movement. So still not meditation, breath work, but something that's a little bit more obvious. And then over time, and when I say time, this can be weeks or months, months depending, <laughs> on the, depending on the case, sometimes years, depending yeah. on the case and the person sitting in front of me. But um, the idea, yes, is that eventually this becomes a form of resilience that's quite deeply embedded into mm. As it was for me, as I worked through yoga as therapy and as I healed from my trauma, I have an internal compass to return back to. Mm. But that is a skills building process. Um, so we never want to, with trauma survivors, and I'm, you know, I'm sure anyone listening to this that's worked with trauma survivors will know this, but you, you want to really steer, steer away from re-triggering. And when I say re-triggering, it's not just a memory, it's also a somatic experience. So when we go too deep, too quickly, too inward, too quickly, too subtle, too quickly, um, mm. that is actually really unhelpful and just can end up recreating the experience of being out of control and frustrated and mm. can't get away or is trying to get away or just shut down. Mm. And we've got to go really, really gently. It's the same reason why practices like yin and restorative are brilliant, but at a point in time. Yeah. Not necessarily the first directly yeah yeah one thing i've come to realize is because trauma is so intense it has such a deep wiring that it's really important to first create a positive wiring on a more physical base and that we have that kind of sense of self that is solid and that we feel some safety and, and create strong wiring to that again and again, no matter how boring it might seem. And until that becomes a habit that you can reshift the, the neural patterns or the wiring, even though the trauma is about to arise, you can feel it and move back into that sense of safety that you've already created over whatever time span. Absolutely. And I think even as therapists and yoga teachers, how we interact with our students is mm -hmm. important so we always want to be working towards noticing and encouraging competency as opposed mm -hmm. to the trauma the traumatic event the tough feelings the overwhelm mm -hmm. so you know on my group therapy programs i'll often have people reach out and say oh like this happened in a, like this happened in class or this happened in the therapy group um you know what does it mean and did i do something wrong and i always always go Thank you so much for reaching out. It's so wonderful to hear how you're taking care of yourself. And um, no, like that's absolutely fine. Like, let's talk about it. What felt good? So I, I, I'm always encouraging myself and the facilitators that work on my programs to focus on competency. They're mm. so used to feeling and feeling area. They're so used to feeling out of control. They're so used to feeling fearful. We should not be 
contributing to that. No, exactly. So innocently, you know, somebody starts talking about their trauma and we're like, tell me more, tell me more. (laughs) Trigger, (laughs) trigger. (laughs) You're like, let's get to the source spot. And I'm like, no, No, stay away. (laughs) Not say that's out of our scope of practice, but also, yeah. But also, it's just, it's actually unhelpful. If you, mm. if you look at all the more recent trauma research, there's loads of trauma researchers and prominent um, trauma experts saying the last thing you want to do is dive into someone's trauma. You're actually directing them <sighs> and yeah. what competency is um, in that. Yeah. 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 So good. So good to hear. <laughs> Yeah, it's very important to, to confirm the goodness because it's there. It always is. It yeah. always is. You know, that human sitting in front of you has chosen to come, mm. has arrived for yoga, has picked up the phone, has sent mm. an email. And to me, that's actually enough. I say to some of the yoga teachers I train and they, they always look at me with very big eyes. I say <laughs> to them, if somebody leaves your class, you're doing a great job. And they're like, why? They're like, why? Like, how could I be doing a great job? I'm like, because for a trauma survivor to get up and leave actually um, shows that they feel safe. Safe enough them. to make that choice. Make a choice that's more mm. nourishing for them, which in a lot of cases for trauma survivors is to leave. And I think that kind of traditional <laughs> approaches in yoga teacher trainings is to keep everybody there till yeah 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 <laughs> until the and close and and closing with the meditation I'm like but that's not actually trauma sensitive yoga um, and we kind of recreating those power dynamics that exist mm. in the trauma processing that's unhelpful mm. um so there's, I think there's a lot of things I say that yoga <laughs> teachers are always a bit taken aback by but. <laughs> No, it's not just my opinion. It's it's rooted in research and it's rooted in my experience. And yeah, what I do and what I do. Yeah, I would like to ask you to um, send me some of those links. Like you sent me one um, article from Bessel van der Kolk and some others, but I would like to put these in the show notes just for people to read the research. So that's very interesting. Um, yeah, tell us about your program. So you've got this beautiful pro bono program called Return to Presence. Please tell okay. us about it. It sounds amazing. Okay, so um, Return to Presence is a free eight-week program that I do for trauma survivors. So it's usually run two to three times a year. Um, when I when I set out to create it and offer it, it was rooted in three things. And that's that I wanted it to be effective, I wanted it to be evidence-based, and I wanted it to be um, accessible. So everything around Return to Presence has been designed for that purpose, right? So when I say effective, we collect data at the start of every program, we collect data at the end of every program, and we analyze what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, who's felt positive effect, who hasn't, and why. It's all anonymous, so nobody feels... um, they have to answer in a certain way and I've redesigned and reiterated that program several times based on that feedback so that's that pillar excellent really yeah um but then we also want it to be evidence-based right so what does research tell us what does um you know the the specialists in this area that are doing academic research randomized control trials um systematic reviews Cochrane reviews like what are they telling us Mm -hmm. is important and not just kind of my opinion and just my anecdotal evidence (laughs) and so I focus a lot on the research so I'm I think I've probably read almost every single yoga for trauma research article (laughs) (laughs) Um, and I've made contact with some wonderful researchers in the US as well as Australia um, and I've read their research and I'm in contact with them so I I do really want it to be evidence-based, so I keep refining it. And then accessible. So, you know, I do work one-on-one. I do do training programs. I have to earn an income. But this is is something that I feel like really needs to be able to give in um, to anybody that needs it. So Mm. it's run entirely online. I've adapted it to remain effective, even if it's run online. Um, and our results show that it is and excellent so anyone that wants to join regardless of their 
kind of um, income status, as long as they've got a laptop and internet connection, which I do get also indicates some privilege, but um, <laughs> they can join, they can join. And we're sort of moving now towards um, getting sponsors on board for the program so we can reach more people. And Excellent. we've only really ventured out into that like the last, this current program is the first time we've had sponsors. Oh, wow. So hopefully, hopefully that'll grow to, what, what I'm really hoping is that it'll grow to the point where we can actually go into communities where there is a lack of internet and computer access mm. and still be able to provide it. So my heart is that it reaches everyone that needs it um, yeah. without being unnecessary barriers. Mm. Which is, you know, the South African context complicated. Yeah. We have have huge inequality. And so it's a complicated project, but I I think we'll get there eventually. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about it because I have no idea. I mean, I hear about how much inequality and how violent it is in South Africa, but I just, I really can't get a picture of it. Is it every day? Is it everywhere? Is it just in some suburbs? What's it like? So I think, so when we talk about crime, Mm -hmm. I mean, South Africa has got one of the highest crime statistics in the world, um, including violent crime. In Mm -hmm. fact, I think it is either the most or the second most dangerous place for a woman to live in the world. Um, We have like I, I, honestly if I had to tell you the statistics you'd probably fall off your chair but um we have se- a serious issue with sexual violence and rape um and we have a serious issue with gender-based violence intimate partner violence um and just actually violent crime you know people being murdered for cell phones and mm-hmm. really low value items but I think you know, the, the the basis of this or kind of the history of this is that South Africa has always been for decades a really unequal society. So we are, again, I think if not the top, one of the top highest countries when it comes to the Gini coefficient. And the Gini coefficient is basically a calculation between the gap between the richest and the poorest. Oh, wow. So India, as an example, is yeah. one of the highest two. So we have a history of inequality, right? We have a history of very, very poor, like people dying of starvation areas. Mm. And we have areas of wealth, but that are completely walled off, cut off, and you can't access unless you live in that particular area. Mm. So, you know, security and safety has a element of privilege in South Africa, which is really, really sad. Um, But it is what it is. And that was born out of apartheid, which I'm sure most people listening will know. So we had government-sponsored racial violence. um, And that only ended 30 years ago, which I know sounds crazy, but it is only 30 years ago. It's only one generation. Um, And it's it's taking our government a very long time, our new government in democratic South Africa, to fix that generational trauma we know mm. with epigenetics and stuff now right that the generational trauma lives on yeah so i know it's a long answer to your question but i think <laughs> just to kind of give you a picture it's a very unequal society it's a very violent society um i personally can't walk outside my house if i go outside uh-huh. my house it has to be in a car um and even in even in the day yeah wow i've got two dogs i have to drive to the park that i go to i can't walk there. wow um and even driving there's certain areas as a female even in a secure car with my doors locked i would never venture oh. to like oh my goodness it would be so you're living with that um which i think makes trauma sensitive yoga in south africa quite different to the states and to europe because it's a it is a current threat it's yeah. not just a perceived current threat, which is how we talk it's a, about it. It's a constant threat also, I imagine. It's a constant threat. So yeah. my my therapy clients, um, private clients as well as group clients, um, they are, are living in a constant state of hyperarousal. And that makes trauma-sensitive yoga really interesting because we're not just <laughs> deep. With- well, it's necessary, obviously. Yeah. Absolutely. We're dealing with an ongoing threat, which um which again makes, terrible. It, makes it really, really tough to work with because you can't kind of promise 
a, a change, a shift. Yeah. Wow. That is heavy. Yeah. 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 Really. <laughs> Um, but you know, I um like there's a there's a scripture that I love, um, Bible scripture, and it says perhaps this is the moment for which you have been created. And I actually have it written and stuck up in my office because it just talking about this, and I know it's heavy, and I know for those listening it might seem like a lot and Candace, you know, why on earth are you but it's 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 a good Africa being well educated. Yeah. Like, um, but I, I think it's good to reflect and to see the yeah. differences it's also like I'm having a hard time with our world right now our government is kind of creating a divide between the people and you see much more anger and frustration and more violence not like at your level but it's making me very sad and days that I'm very stressed I can't imagine what it's like when you know it's been like that for the whole of your life and you have no end in sight whereas me i hope that this is just connected to the covid situation and there will be some kind of resolution soon yeah, yeah. no that's that's true but you know that's what makes in my from my perspective it's what makes yoga therapy for trauma so important because mm finding the present moment being aware of the present moment and yes of course we're living in this incredibly dangerous volatile environment but we can now right now we are safe and is that mm. not what yoga teaches us right mm. so it's even more pertinent to be helping south africans create inner awareness of safety and presence and resource yeah. and resource and integration because they are going out into a very broken world into yeah. a very broken country and the only way we can truly affect change is by starting with that sense of safety ourselves um it just yeah it, it, it really is even though there's a current threat it almost meant to me makes it more important that we that we cultivate mindfulness in a country like this definitely definitely yeah and so you keep saying we you are plusieurs there are more of you working together on this project <laughs> yes so um i train trauma sensitive yoga teachers um and then then a handful of them do work on the group therapy program afterwards oh great so i um ultimately still lead the program design it handle the debriefings handle the referrals and containment um especially if there's a high risk case but the facilitators um support and actually facilitating the classes um, and getting the themes of the program kind of rolled out and through the weeks mm. so yes that's why i say <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so, so you're you're creating that community that i was talking about before we started recording that's great and i just want to ask so before these people come into the the program you do a private just to get to know what their needs are so I don't do a private one-on-one, -on -one, but no. I do do an intake. Yeah. Okay. So I do do an intake. Um, sorry, excuse my dog's barking in the background. Oh, he wants to be part of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, so I do. So we do do an intake, um, which is essentially an intake form. Um, I obviously very quickly pick up if there is a serious risk with a particular mm. person or particular case. Um, and in that case, uh, I do one-on-one -on -one and decide whether it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's quite a close community that forms after that. So we've got a community WhatsApp group, um, as well as mm -hmm. one that's just kind of announcements that they find what the community WhatsApp group too large. Um, and then I make quite a, I attend every single class, even if I'm not facilitating. Um, mm -hmm. And I do select certain people to reach out to directly if I'm noticing something that needs my attention. Yeah. Okay, great. Sounds very safe. Yes, it's quite a bit of work. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I imagine a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of okay. attention and presence. Yeah. Yeah, return to Absolutely. presence. But, you know, again, like that pillar, it has to be effective. So for me, mm. 
those are all opportunities to check what's working, what's not working. If this is not effective and safe for you, there is a different way. Um, so I've got quite a strong network of referrals in terms of other counselors, psychologists, and other specialists. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people that exit the program if we realize it's not helping and it's not effective. Mm, that's good. So less about me and what I can do and more about um, Person, helping the person yeah the person course. actually experiencing some kind of shift that you know that's what you want yeah exactly and even the trauma sensitive yoga research not a hundred percent of people that are helped that's not how research works <laughs> you are, but yeah. there are some proportion that aren't and that's going to exist in any modality and I, I think we do our students and our clients no favors when we try force a modality mm. that might not work for them mm. Yeah, this is this has been a point that's come up for me with people, clients, but also just speaking to family members and friends that they've or students that they've been turned away from a certain place and been told, sorry, we can't help you anymore, but not been given another alternative or not referred directly onwards. And then often these people have internalized it that there's something wrong with them rather than just that modality doesn't work and you have to try many different inroads and I think that's what is so nice about yoga is that we have different inroads when it's yoga therapy we can try different ways if a meditation doesn't work if the breath doesn't work maybe it's the body if it's not the body maybe it's journaling if it's you know, so there's so many ways that self-inquiry, awareness, all these different tools. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I think it's something I actually learned um, through the psychologists I work with. And it's such an important point you raise here. Like I, if I refer someone, I don't just, A, I, I don't say, sorry, we can't help you. And that's <laughs> that. Right? That's definitely not helpful, but it's also not trauma-informed. Yeah, it's um, painful <laughs> and it's just and it's actually taking choice and control away from the person so we reinforcing mm. the trauma mm -hmm. so i always check in with them about what's working what's not working do they think it would be better to be referred of course if it's a imminent suicide risk is a different protocol but like in general terms it's not what's happening so i give them choices and options of what they might try mm. and if they select a psychologist seeing a psychologist or a counselor i contact the psychologist then, or counselor yeah. i check that they've got availability that they're happy to take on the referral so you because also it's all fine and well to say yes i'm going to refer you and he has the contact details but if they contact that person and the person's practice is full as happens often in south africa because of our shortage of mental health professionals mm -hmm. how have i helped i've now just recreated a rejection yeah that and they and they're probably too scared to reach out to someone else they don't know i yeah. mean most of the clients that i've referred haven't seen a psychologist or if they've seen one it hasn't worked out and you know there's not a Huge choice. Like just, and how do they even choose? They yeah, exactly. What necessary is going to work for them or not? So you know, it's, I read. And how much time does that take? You know, it mm. takes me five minutes to have a call with the psychologist. Mm. Five minutes that can be the difference between somebody getting the help they need versus, not. like you said, internalizing it and it actually creating even more damage unnecessarily. Yeah, definitely. Oh, thank you yeah yeah it's important to say that it's just been coming up the last few weeks with a lot of people and then I all of a sudden put two and two together oh yeah that's why they got so stuck for so long so some people have been going around in circles for 20 years because they've internalized that not realizing there's just different things you have to try absolutely yeah and holding, that, you know, holding that client in mind even I've got clients I've worked with one-on-one -on -one and our times come to an end but I still believe in holding them in mind mm. and checking in with them and if I see something that reminds me of something they said sharing it with them it's such a simple act mm. but we underestimate how important that relationship is for that client yeah and it's not just about what we get paid for no no it's no 
it's about their life <laughs> yeah absolutely it's a yeah. relationship they've formed it's trust they've put in you mm. and to me those clients are relationships for life regardless mm. of how often they come back how often they don't what they've paid what they haven't to me <laughs> it, and it doesn't i'm not checking in with them every single week i'm not saying that but to mm. me it's a relationship that's been formed and i hold those people in mind regardless of of where that relationships come to you yeah beautiful thank you that's lovely <laughs> and it's important i also feel that way um let me see yeah, so I think you even talked about this in the beginning, that it's so important that to mention that yoga therapy is a very effective alternative and is also cost effective and that that's so important. But I think that's why it's also undermined a lot because once people have those tools, you can't profit from them anymore. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's not a very profitable business model. <laughs> yeah. I mean, looking from outside, not so much as a yoga therapist, but I'm sure there's other companies who are not very interested in this being spread around the world. So <laughs> tell us why the mind-body approach is so effective in healing from trauma. Please share what your insights have been over the years. You know, this is one of those topics where, um, I don't know if you've seen on some face, like entrepreneurship Facebook groups, they say like, what could you talk on for an hour that you would need no preparation for? <laughs> Good, <laughs> go for yoga, it. Yoga therapy for trauma. <laughs> um, but I, think, I, I mean, I think we've, we've covered a lot of it, but, you know, probably the most important thing for me is that trauma happens physiologically. That's how trauma happens, right? We respond with our sympathetic nervous system we are sympathetic our body is sympathetic to what's happening and is trying to protect us we're in a relationship exactly um yeah. yet traditional approaches have almost no concern for what happens physically or physiologically <laughs> which is exactly why i went on to develop a chronic pain condition yeah. because there was no um there was no integration of what had happened to me physically so when i think about yoga therapy for trauma and trauma sensitive yoga i know i'm using those terms interchangeably and it's just because the research i'm in kind of uses them interchangeably but it is so effective because it deals with the physiological response of what happened and it deals with the physiological resilience of how to rise above what happened and move forward into post-traumatic growth. And there's lots of different reasons for that, why it's so effective. But, you know, if we had to, if we had to break it down into something really simple, just stimulating our vagus nerve through extended exhales is a very healing to our sympathetic nervous system. And something as simple as that can start to alter how our body responds in stressful situations such mm -hmm. a simple technique mm -hmm. that can make such a difference to a trauma survivor and how they integrate experiences something like getting a severely contracted psoas softer mm -hmm. and start to have uh, more freedom of movement we know the psoas is incredibly devastating in some situations affected by trauma and can be chronically contracted for years decades, decades. yeah um, and helping a client to bring awareness back to that area of the body mm. and change how they move, which can change mm. how they think. And so, how they feel. Exactly. And I've seen it in so many different areas of the body. So, I mean, the psoas is one. I've seen it in the shoulders. I've seen it in the feet. Mm. Um, I, you know, I've seen it in clients where they have pelvis. Put pelvis. Literally, they can't put they tend toes on the floor, their mm. kneecaps are super tight, their quadriceps are super tight. And oh, um, yeah. so there's so many different places where trauma shows up and, I, and obviously because, uh, yeah, can reside. And obviously because I know in most cases, some of the story, they've chosen to share some of the story. Um, but trauma ultimately, trauma happens physiologically. 
yet we attempt to deal with it cognitively. We mm. attempt to heal from it cognitively. And it's not that there's no place for cognition. I am a counselor. I have a counseling <laughs> practice. I do do talk therapy. So it's not that there's no option for cognitive therapy. It's just that we are missing a huge part of this puzzle by leaving the body out. And I think there's a huge proportion of our clients we're doing a massive disservice by not incorporating the body. So I actually train counselors and psychologists on bringing the body back into counseling because mm -hmm. I've said to them, when you're working with a trauma client, I really think you're doing them a disservice by not being trained in how this is being held physiologically. You don't need to be a yoga therapist. No. You just need to start to get them curious about the body to yeah. actually be able to heal. Yeah. yeah. I know that was going to be a long answer. But oh, no, I love it. You could go on all day and I would just be thinking this is juicy stuff. I like it. Um, can you just for people to clarify, because I also think that physiology is so important. So it's not the physical, it's not the mental. It's I think what we in yoga therapy and Ayurveda would call um, the energy body, our physiology, our breath but also the hormones and um, the visceral feelings that are flowing through the body. So for me, emotions has been a big thing, a big study and understanding them and relating them to the hormonal effects and what that creates to the mind and then the physical body. So, yeah. All of it. You're 100% yeah. right. I mean, I... This is quite a controversial statement, but mm -hmm. it is something I believe. <laughs> is I, I really believe emotions start as physical sensations. Oh. Because I can see in my clients, mm -hmm. and that's why I said it's controversial, because not everyone will agree with me, I know. Yeah, no, it's just a nice starting point. Like, oh, let's have a look at it from that angle. <laughs> um, but I really, you know, I can see in my clients when so when i do my intake with my with my private clients we go through as i'm for most yoga therapists do we go through a physical assessment a physical alignment assessment right starting at the feet all the way to the top of the head we look at alignment um but because i'm a yoga therapist that specializes in trauma and mental health i'm also doing emotional and psychological alignment mm. and i can tell you 99 percent of my cases what i'm picking up with psych psychology and emotions, I'm picking up in the physical body too. Mm. So I do believe that there are that emotions start as physical sensations that then become emotions, and we attach thoughts and, um, I suppose, words to that experience. And when we start to deal with the physical sensations. Mm -hmm. we can start to alter the emotional response and the thoughts and the words that are attached to that emotional response. So that's kind of the chain I see. So to give you mm -hmm. a very simple example, I've had clients with um, thyroid issues and with neck issues and understanding their trauma history, there is often a situation of having a voice repressed. Of course. <laughs> Yes, we're yes. having something not heard. So yeah. when we start to change the, the pattern, because I'm not a chiro, but <laughs> change kind of how they hold their neck, how they hold their chin, how they hold their shoulders, we start to create more uh, blood flow, we start to create more openness, suddenly they find their voice. Yeah, And I'm like, that is... So it's starting physically. Maybe it started differently at the beginning, but at the moment... It, it's become, it's become yeah it becomes a physical holding pattern because for me I see emotions first I thought it was from the soul then I thought it was from the psyche now I'm kind of seeing them in your in Ayurveda or Sanskrit it's all actually called rasa and rasa means juice so the physiological juice like Candace Pert you know Candace Pert mm -hmm. so yeah the molecules of emotions but it so if we're working with the energy body, if energy stays stagnant long enough, it becomes a physical development. It becomes so solid, you can actually experience it viscerally, sensually. So for me, it's, it's like this energy pattern that's been held so long, it's become a solid thing like fibromyalgia. It's just so much pain in the body that has been suppressed and repressed and yeah. Absolutely. 
you know, also interestingly, and I think this might also inf has informed my opinion around kind of somatic experience of emotions is that in Africa, mm. we've got quite a strong oral tradition. Mm -hmm. And typically what you'll find in Africa is that we explain psychological challenges with somatic words. Oh, wow. So this has come out in local research. Like you will have patients at a GP saying, I've got a headache, like my headaches are constant. And when you unpack that, they're talking a little bit more about tension and depressive episodes, but they're describing it through. Ah. <laughs> so I think that that's also why I kind of mean that way, just because okay. of the context that people generally don't describe uh, in the South African context, depression is depression or anxiety is anxiety or an okay. thought. It'll be my tummy sore. Okay. Or I feel like I can't breathe, um, mm. which I think actually might be true of um, of a lot of countries where there is um, extreme poverty, where there's issues around language, where there's I think healthcare. I think it might actually be quite common. I think it's also um, just even in my family as a child growing up, I think there's a lack of body. And, and emotional awareness, not being able to distinguish between hunger and anger or irritation and uh, some kind of nervous feeling. You know, there's such a fine line because it's physiology or physical. So yes, and I, it was only when I started to unpeel and unravel this for myself as a study that I started to see yeah, it's, it's very difficult to understand what an emotion is. But at the same time, emotions are what run our world. The reason people are such consumers, the reason we do horrible things, the reason we make beautiful artwork or dance with wild abandon is from emotions. The reason you make love is, or a child is out of emotion. So, I mean, they are the beauty and the bane and that's why I think it's so important to, to understand them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I often, with a client, if they, also, if they say to me, oh, I feel anxious or I now feel sad, I, my first question in 90% of cases is where in your body are you feeling that? Mm. And then mm, good once, idea. And then once we get to where in your body, okay, it's in my tummy, okay? What does what it, does it feel, feel like? like yes. <laughs> does it feel like a burn does it feel like a sharp pain a dull pain like I'll, I'll prompt them and give them things and just that can be so enlightening mm -hmm. where the emotion's coming from the physical sensation that precedes it mm -hmm. and then move into therapy right because then you can start talking about therapeutic tools yeah then you know what to do yeah so I, yeah I, I really believe this stuff <laughs> Me too. Well, well I, I see them. I see them as, as actually starting in the, the physiological body. I really see them as the energy. So emotion, energy in motion and yes. understanding. So the book I've written, I'm just getting very excited because someone gets it. The book I've written is, is um, associating certain emotions with the elements and the chakras. And therefore you can see where you are on the continuum of emotions because they are connected obviously and they can shift if you start to let that energy move and you move with them and so yes then you have those, this whole toolbox of tools that you could use to start channeling yeah no, i 100 percent agree and i think you know over seeing hundreds right it is now hundreds of people mm -hmm. um you see patterns, you see themes, you see where physical Great holding kind of represents certain emotions and you see that across so many people that yeah. that anecdotal evidence as yoga therapists is so powerful um, because it's not just a, it's not just guesswork, it's actually no. based on experience, what you're seeing across people and those that like what you're talking about in your book and what you've discovered i mean it's exactly what i've discovered so that just shows you that <laughs> yeah and we're on the other side of the planet we haven't spoken before <laughs> and research is catching up to that you know i think yeah. 
I think for a long time as yoga therapists, and I say a long time, it's not like I've been in the field for decades, but from what I hear from, from my experienced yoga therapists is I think for a long time we were kind of shut off in a corner and it was, you know, hocus pocus. It was things that, 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 that was magic and we couldn't really understand and was just kind of, yeah, you know, you get what I mean. I think yoga teachers experience the same thing. But yeah. research because I'm in it and I'm mm. doing a master's degree, research is catching up to what we've known for centuries. Yeah, or decades, um, yeah. yeah. So I think it's so important to lean into these anecdotal um, experiences and themes. And yes, maybe not all the academic evidence is there and not every specialist, psychologist, doctor. will agree. Yeah. But what we've seen in the last 10 years has given us great hope for me as a yoga therapist that actually science is catching up yeah there's things coming out now in research that are proving exactly what we've known what? and seen to be working so yeah this is just kind of an encouragement to the yoga therapist out there trust yourself um there doesn't always have to be a piece of paper that proves what you're saying your experience can be proved long after you've existed as a yoga therapist <laughs> yeah thank you that is so great Thank you. I love you saying that. <laughs> okay, is there anything else you'd like to share or? I'm sure I don't think so. I mean, I, I think all I'd probably say is if you are interested in trauma sensitive yoga and yoga therapy for trauma, there are incredible people out there doing such amazing things. Some of the really prominent uh, trauma researchers you'll know, like Peter Devine, Bessel van der Kolk, Gabriel Maté. Pat I, Ogden. Let's not forget but, the women. Pat Ogden. Yes, true. Yes, you're yes. right. Candice Clark. <laughs> 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 um, I definitely don't consider myself on their level. But anyway, <laughs> it, like, you know, buy, buy their books. There's loads of free talks that they do, but also look at things like Google Scholar if you've got access to academic research. There is mm. trauma sensitive yoga research now, not so much in Africa, I'll probably be the first. But <laughs> in Europe, in Western Europe, in Australia, and in the USA, people are doing this work and producing really interesting results. Right. So if you're interested in this field, there is stuff out there to research, um, and there's great training schools too for uh, yoga therapy for men to help it's an exciting time it's kind of like it's a new time it's still quite new and niche but there's enough that if you're really passionate about this you could get get skilled up pretty thoroughly um, mm. that we do have yeah. great okay wonderful all right do you want to leave us with something a practice or do you need to get going i can leave you with a practice i think there's one practice i want to leave you with that um is very simple Okay. Literally, I can explain it probably in one or two sentences. So <laughs> it's a practice that I use with almost every single trauma survivor I work with, and usually within the first or second session, and it's called the I am here breath. Mm -hmm. And all it is, is on the in breath, say I am, and on the out breath, here, and repeat that five to ten times. It's a beautiful way to restore broken mind body relationships um, mm. and also a beautiful way to start to create resilience and safety internally for somebody that is that is struggling with that and it's just so accessible right you can do it yeah. anywhere way, anywhere you are and in fact i refer to it on group therapy programs as a safety exit so i often say in my classes if this pose is feeling overwhelming if this pose is not feeling good for you if you want an alternative, maybe you don't want to leave, don't want to rest, you want something else, your safety exit is the I am here breath. Repeat that for five to ten times and then decide if you'd like to return. Mm -hmm. So it can be a tool after therapy, but it can also be a tool in therapy yeah. that somebody can use as their safety, yeah, their safety exit essentially. Yeah, yeah. Very simple. Okay, yeah, because uh, Molly Burkholm, she she's an IRS teacher, but she always does that breath too. And I found it very, yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. That's yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. Well, All right. 
yeah that's it do you want do you want me to say where people can reach me what I'm yes doing? leave okay. leave okay. everything cool. behind <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so you can reach me on my website. So candiceclark.co.za is my website. Um, that's got all the information on who I am, what I do. I tend to spend a lot of time on Instagram as kind of my chosen social media platform. <laughs> you need to remember my handle now. It's at candiceclarkvz, um, but you can also find that on my website. And in terms of working with me, obviously, like you've heard, I, I work one-on-one, -on -one, I work on group therapy programs, I do quite a bit of consulting with counsellors and psychologists too, so I've got training for counsellors and psychologists on my website, um, I also run a free reading group for counsellors and psychologists that are interested in the work. Wow. Um, and then as a, as a yoga teacher or yoga therapist, I do do trauma sensitive um, yoga teacher training too. So I've got a level one and a level two that I offer that's online. So it can be attended from anywhere in the world. Wow. So great, Candice. You're amazing. How many things are you doing? I know. I was just listing them out. And I was like, actually, that's why I feel so busy this week. <laughs> this week, this month, this year. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was also doing some trainings this last two weeks on one on Facebook ads and one on email um, list building. And I had to tell the guys what I was doing. And as, as I was saying all the things I was doing every week, I was like, wow, oh, and this and this. And I was like, oh, my God, no wonder I'm busy. <laughs> I know, right? and I feel like you're so passionate about the work as well, right? You, you, I find I tend to kind of tentacle out. Yeah, there's so many interesting. Parts yeah, it's all I'm interesting. Sure. <laughs> I, I, I want to be able to tentacle out to all of it. Um, but I think I, I think I have tried. I suppose this year specifically, just to because because as a licensed counselor, I mean, I could end up in all sorts of different areas, and I think I've really just tried to be of service to trauma survivors mm. and kind of whatever's come out of that whether it's helping counselors and psychologists or yoga teachers and yoga therapists it's all being centered around like how do we support the trauma survivor so that's probably my like golden thread i think yeah 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 it definitely sounds like you have a thread <laughs> okay we're gonna leave our listeners thank you for staying to the end everyone um i hope you enjoyed this bye candace Bye. So thank you everyone for staying to the end of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I really love doing these talks with these amazing people. And if you want to know more, just take a look in the show notes. There's plenty of links and ways to connect with either the guest or myself if you want to work with us or find out more about us just check out the information in the show notes so i hope you have a wonderful weekend or week and you'll be hearing from me next week bye